Good evening. This is De Facto Review, a weekly analysis of Mongolia's leaders' political, economic, and social issues by economists and communist Mr. Jaral Sahin. Good evening. And I'll be your host, Tik Shirut. Today's topics are on the preliminary findings of the UN Working Group um, on Arbitrary Detention, the future of the Heritage Fund in the Future Heritage Fund in Mongolia, and the monetary policy for next year presented by the Bank of Mongolia. So a lot of uh, very heavy three topics this week. Right? Yeah, very important three um, topics. So the first topic is the, the heaviest of all, I would say. It was at the invitation of the government, the United States uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention visited Mongolia this, um, it, this month between the dates of 3rd and 14th of October by, uh, at the invitation of the government. And the working group was represented by Ms. Elina Streinert of Latvia and Mr. Matthew Gillett of New Zealand. And accompanied by staff of the office of the United States High Commissioner for Human Rights. And this was the first official, official visit by the group to Mongolia. And um, the, they wrote up the preliminary report and they will serve as a basis for future deliberations between members of the working group and the working group will then produce and adopt a report about um, this visit and submit it to the UN Human Rights Council for its 54th session next year in September. So um, what finding from this report was uh, most, most surprising to you? Yeah, you know, the very fact that this working group come to Mongolia by the invitation of the Mongolian government who had facilitated their free work here and arranged all the visits they want. Mm -hmm. They have visited several prisons, uh, thought, um, detention centers, um, sobering up places, temporary protection shelters, the National Center for Mental Health, etc. also sustain, s substance addiction treatment center where they had interviewed people, some 60 plus, and visited 21, this kind of places, noticed and unnoticed, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's very important for Mongolia visit, in particular their report, its preliminary report, as you said, and it will be discussed next year, September, at the, high, the UN uh, Human Rights Council. And for Mongolia, for Mongolian enforcement agencies, policy, police, et cetera, very important things. Also anti-corruption agency, mm -hmm. uh, the intelligence office, all together have a right to detain people. So whether this detention is going on or right or not, this report said that 99% of people detained uh, last year, a year before, all have uh, done without any, uh, their consent. They very much detailed report about how the people come just to police and for just uh, interview, then they are arrested, mm -hmm. detained, and 99% of Mongolian arrests for last two years, uh, they come as a witness, but they arrested as a suspect. So very nice report they have done it, and I think Mongolia has to work a lot on that. So the majority of arrests in Mongolia were made without warrants from... 99%. Mm -hmm. So that means so no... Very um, alarming signal to Mongolians, ordinary people, that mm -hmm. how it is happening in democratic Mongolia. So that's why they made a lot of details in how to prevent some of them, the report says. The importantly, the report first says about the Nation the Human Rights Commission of Mongolia, NHRC. This one is established by a special designated law in 2000 mm -hmm. with three commissioners. And in 2020, it was amended, this law, because it was a previous recommendations of the Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. of the UN. And they have extended, now we have a nine, uh, no, sorry, seven commissioners, uh, but they have inadequate financing, according to this uh, 
uh, in order to be really free from other power, they should have uh, be financed properly. The, the other thing very important I find from this report is about the creation of national preventive mechanism, NPM. It was long overdue for Mongolia because Mongolia had joined the optional protocol to the Convention Against the Torture, OPCAT, in 2015. Mm -hmm. And according to this one, Mongolia should have this NPM. Finally, they have it uh, last, from last year, and that mandate is vested uh, with the one commissioner, new commissioner, Mr. Telman. So this person is, uh, this commissioner is in charge of this NPM work. Mm -hmm. However, he is only have five staff for such a large country like Mongolia to visit prisons, all these facilities with five people, unnoticed to come or unannounced to come, mm -hmm. not easy. So it should be 10 as it was planned. And also it is, its financing depends on human rights uh, the organization, not he personally, he can select somebody and send it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, how you can come unnoticed, come and check the, how much the freedom of uh, right, uh, the, I mean, the human rights are observed in, in such an area where people have uh, been detained. Mm -hmm. The other thing also I should mention is uh, Mongolia had revised criminal procedure code, CPC, in 2017. Several amendments were made, though the most importantly, there was uh, the initial detention in police custody cannot exceed six hours. Mm -hmm. Yet, Mongolians, Mongolian police arresting people uh, not only six hours, even more than 48 hours, which, is, which was maximum. And there was even a Black Friday, so-called. Because within if some, police arrested somebody, and within 48 hours, they should have a permission from the pro, pro, prosecutor. Mm -hmm. But if you arrest uh, Friday night, then weekend is not a count because prosecutor is not working. Mm -hmm. As a result, this guy is sitting there in more than uh, sometimes you know, three, four days. Mm -hmm. So this report clearly says even the amount of some of them. So there's an issue where, um, where apprehendees, the people that are arrested, do not get um, adequate information on their arrests, right? And I, I also read in this report that 40% of convictions had um, something to do with confessions. And um, the report says that uh, Mongo although Mongolian law recognizes the suspect's right to access a lawyer, um, before making any confessions of guilt. A lot of confessions were made without the presence of a lawyer, so there have been instances of coer coercing um, you know, apprehended people into confessions. Indeed. So that was also uh, there was some 12,000 to 13,000 cases, criminal cases, uh, considered by the court, mm -hmm. out of which, as you said, 40% reportedly involve confessions. Mm -hmm. Confessions in general not so bad, it, or un, uh, if we know that this, is, this confession is not made through interrogation, mm -hmm. which is the case. Many people in, interviewed said that they had to have a, com a confession. Mm -hmm. So this is not the best way. And uh, confessions were coerced from suspects against their will through pressure, threats, and intimidation. Mm -hmm. So that's something that uh, people talk about long time, and it's good that this uh, report saying about that. The other thing was also working group received consistent testimony from that interview, which was confidential interview, that uh, customary for the police to initially summon people to their police stations as witnesses, and they are normally de facto not free to leave. Mm -hmm. So detaining people without their consent is very serious uh, violation of human rights. So, and also they talked about the police custody. 
usually it's they, people have typically not at the liberty to leave from the interrogation. Mm. And very hard to say, was it interrogation or interview? They call it Mendes principle. Uh, the people, it's completely different in forcing somebody to really recognize or say that they are guilty, etc. Mm -hmm. So this kind of very nice uh, paper they have prepared, and I think now it's up to civic society, Mongolian citizens, and the Human Rights Commission of Mongolia to make sure that these reports, alarming reports, are really followed, in particular their recommendations, for the sake of better democracy, better freedom of Mongolian people. Mm. So what happens when the full report is released next year? So when they discuss the issue at um, next year's... Uh, by um, that time, next year, Council. I think now we have now about one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, d during this time, Mongolia is to uh, correct uh, mistakes and follow these reports. For example, in prisons, people are, for example, very much... Uh, they have uh, some prize, they call it prize days, bonus days. If you follow well, then cut a day from your, depending on which, or they add to the, your terms mm. to serve, <laughs> your, uh, ser <laughs> to, 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 uh, to the terms that are sitting there. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are not formalized, so it's very arbitrary whether they, you will, they will increase or decrease that uh, bonus so stage. It just depends on the, the, basically the prison warden, so it, there's no regulation on it. There, yes, no regulations, and it's very arbitrary by the, these guards. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, there, in the, the report says that um, in, uh, the, in front of each cell, there is a line dividing corridor in them, and it's about just one meter from the wall, mm -hmm. and if you cross that, it's regarded you have a kind of runaway or very harsh penalty. Mm -hmm. So you can just make small mistake and you either step on that line or over the line, you have either the bonus day minus or plus. Mm -hmm. So this kind of arbitrary approach is really uh, not good. And uh, in some cases, in Mongolian prisons, they say it's very strict mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> For example, they went to the special closed unit 405. Mm -hmm. The people, when they're meeting their family members or in library, they go all the time with hand and leg cuffs. Mm -hmm. That's unacceptable because there are so many other guards and many cameras and why it is to be happening. It's not happening in other countries. That's what the, the report said. So mm -hmm. I really enjoyed reading the report and very enthusiastic about all civic society to, to make sure that the state of Mongolia follows and implements those recommendations. Let's move on to our next topic. The Future Heritage Fund of Mongolia uh, is Mongolia's sover sovereign wealth populated from mineral revenues with long-term savings objectives. And it was established by a dedicated law in 2016 in accordance with the fiscal management principle set by the fiscal stabil stability law that calls for fair and equitable distribution of national wealth to the present and future generations. So the main source of this fund is um, the portion of mineral, mineral royalties and dividend distributed to state shares. So um, there is a similar fund in different countries. For example, the most successful one is the um, fund in Norway called the Government Pension Fund Global, also known as the Oil Fund, which was established in 1990 to invest in the, invest the surplus revenues of the Norwegian petroleum sector. And it has over $1.19 trillion in assets and holds 1.4% uh, of all of the world's listed companies, making it the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. So um, as of December of last year, it was worth about $250,000 per citizen of, of Norway, uh, so which is a huge number. 
and um, it also holds portfolios in real estate and fixed income investments. So we can see that you know funds like this can be very successful if done right. So what can uh, Mongolia do to achieve similar success? Well, we try. Uh, the Norway Foundation, Norway is a fund. I think several hundred Mongolians have visited by this time. Timasak is well in Singapore. And the, the anecdote says that the Singapore fund asked Mongolians, you have been some 157 people visited our fund and just learning. And when you will do, finally, mm -hmm. that was the question. So many visits, many no, no but uh, because the government, parliament keep changing probably this other reason why so many people have visited. Mm -hmm. However, it's very important and to learn from these funds, as you have mentioned, there is also Chile Foundation, mm -hmm. Chile Fund. Uh, you have just talked about Norway. Uh, Mongolians have tried first they made to, in 2010, finally, uh, a special law, deficit fiscal stability law, and started to implement in 2013. And by that law, the def budget deficit is to be less than 2% of the GDP. Unfortunately, they have changed this law, keep changing. And um, so the problem in Mongolian case is uh, always this, not stability. Everything they do and then, then change, they amend, etc. Mm -hmm. And in the same case with this uh, uh, Mongolian Sovereign Wealth Fund, we have two kinds of fund today. One is a stability fund, budget stability fund. Mm -hmm. The other is um, future inheritance inheritance fund, okay? But the future inheritance fund, special law made in 2017, mm -hmm. but before that there was a human development fund and all tried to kind of distribute mining wealth, uh, mining wealth like the other countries we have mentioned uh, to people in equal manner. Mm -hmm. But the, the future inheritance fund is, uh, it is, uh, the future generation is to be also using. In 30 year, for 30 years, it will not be used. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, the Human Development Fund was, has the same idea, but they have, uh, there have been nine years or so uh, functioning. Then the, it became not fund. It became a, with huge deficit because they have promised money to people and they start to give just to not to be elected. And finally, uh, the after long discussions, they made this future fund for future generation. And from the human uh, future generation fund, uh, first paid the deficit of that human development fund. Mm -hmm. And they start to uh, um, accumulate money there only since 2019, only three years. Mm -hmm. And now there is about around two and a half uh, uh, trillion MNT in this fund. Uh, both fund has own uh, procedure now. Mm. And for example, this uh, future fund, uh, they say they say that by 2017, it will be 231 trillion MNT. And 56 of it will come from mining, but another 165 is coming from investment return. But I think it's a little bit, it's, at least there is a, such a document, and I think it's not very realistic. But it's uh, up very, too optimistic? Too optimistic. <laughs> Only 56,000 uh, trillion MNT comes, and they make uh, three times more than that. It's how come the return comes three times than the fund? Mm. But however, what is realistic is once we started to implement this law, the people should make sure that the... Uh, Another parliament comes and not amend that law and started to use the other money. We are almost in a very uh, difficult situation now, and we will talk about that under our third topic. So the third topic actually is the monetary policy for next year. So the Bank of Mongolia presented its monetary policy to parliament, and within the framework of approving the policy, of a public forum was held regarding the main direction of the government's uh, monetary policy for next year. The governor of the Bank of Mongolia, uh, Mr. Tlaug Surang, highlighted that Mongolia's economy is affected by unfavorable um, external conditions, but economic growth is expected to reach 
3% at the end of this year and 4 to 5% next year in his speech during the discussion. So um, one, so the major objective for next year's monetary policy seems to be getting um, ahead of inflation or getting down to single digit inflation. So um, will, do you think the monetary um, policy for next year supports this and do you think it's realistic to reach uh, one digit, single digit inflation? Well, that's uh, on the guess. Mm -hmm. Because now the inflation is around 16%, mm -hmm. and the Mongol Bank is estimating it will be under 8%, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's like less than half, or more than half. Yes, and uh, how realistic is this? Uh, according to some parliament members, uh, this is not realistic because we have a huge budget with mm -hmm. deficit, uh, with also another 5% uh, mm -hmm. uh, deficit. Uh, GDP equivalent deficit mm -hmm. and 20 trillion MNT tax revenue is almost 40% of GDP mm -hmm. which says Mongolian government is it's like a, a small body with huge head mm -hmm. so whether how much this head this body can carry that head is another issue and with within these circumstances it's very hard to implement uh, monetary policy for next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> because the government is all time extending, they keep central bank very much dependent on the government uh, through some work like, for example, this uh, mortgage loan, which was supposed a long time ago to be in the balance of the government because it's a budgetary work, it's social work, and mm -hmm. why it should be in the balance of Mongol Bank, which is still there, and Mongol Bank is still planning to continue. You know, they are threatening Mongol Bank, uh, governor almost, if they will not do it, he will be fired. Almost like the, this is the his situation now. And for, first, huge government should cut it. It means, uh, I mean, in particular, the budget should be without deficit. Mm. That's what the, the many parliament members, a few parliament members demand because the parliament now 80, 5% uh, belongs to one political party. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is we will have a huge difficulty with payment balance next year. Mm -hmm. In 2023, there will be total 1.5 billion USD dollar bonds. Development Bank, Samurai Bond, and the other two bonds of the government are to be paid. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet our foreign currency reserve is only 2.5 million today, a billion US dollar today which covers only two or so, one, two and a half months of our import. So this is uh, not enough, and yet there is also Mongol Bank on debt to China swap, mm -hmm. so-called two, uh, two and a half billion um, uh, US dollar. Mm -hmm. If they are not extending their term for the third times, you know, our leaders go to China and uh, begging, please extend that. And it looks like they will extend again. Soon the president is going to visit China. So if they will not extend, Mongolia have even additional burden on that. Uh, so within these uh, circumstances, it's very hard to have the inflation under one digit. Mm -hmm. And within these circumstances, uh, also to have to Greek rate with US dollar 3,600 3, plus. Uh, so Mongol Bank challenge is huge. And this with the current today's payment balance, and in particular next year when all this bonds payment due, then it's very hard to keep also to Greek rate in this level. Mm. Because, you know, only, only hope that government is, has is mm, we will increase export of coal and copper. That's, that's what they're banking on, right? They're very, they seem like um, that they're very uh, convinced that it's going to happen. That, that, very sure that's that. both sides and the uh, central bank was also opt optimistic about that. They will buy from the people some 20 to 22 tons of gold next year, 
Uh, every year around this amount, Mongol Bank is buying from gold uh, producers at the international price, London price. So people mm -hmm. give them and only 2.5% royalty they pay. Once they uh, increase that royalty to 5%, then half of the gold had disappeared. It means how much we are losing through borders, through the illegal way, uh, many gold. So they put back 2.5% on the royalty. So Mongol Bank is hoping that. The other thing is <clears throat> uh, now central bank policy uh, rate is 12%. Now central bank policy rate is at the level of 12%. Cannot go up because if they go up, there will be no loan. Mm -hmm. Commercial banks will be more keeping money in the central bank money. Central bank, in the central bank account. And if there is a no loan to the businesses, then there will be no growth of GDP. Mm. So we are really in tough situation and the government has to um, cut many big programs. Uh, and uh, also another problem is state-owned enterprises. They do a lot of budgetary work. For example, the Irtnes Tawan Talgay was paying for a lot of social work. Irtinet was paying for electricity mm -hmm. of all people. So, and the, as I said, Mongol Bank is running that a mortgage, a loan, etc. All these kind of things to be cut. But it is not that easy, easier said than done. So the budget standing committee of the parliament have discussed now the policy proposed by Mongol Bank, uh, monetary policy, policy for next year, which by the way is consisting of two parts. One is in overall, because government, it's because the, it's parliament decisions that monetary policy has two parts. One is uh, in general what the government has to do. The second, what the Mongol bank has to do, uh, given direction to the Mongol bank. So in the second part of uh, the Mongol bank, um, they are rather optimistic. They think that there is no stagflation in Mongolia. Now, not anymore, because first quarter, uh, no, first half of uh, this year, uh, the GDP growth was minus 1.9. One, 1. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the second growth, for second half of this year, it looks like to be around three or more, mm -hmm. which doesn't go into that place where economy, economic growth is very slow, yet inflation is coming up. Mm -hmm. In that situation, they call it stagflation. And according to the governor of the central bank, this year is not to be, to be for that. So let's see, because the, by the end of November, by the law, the parliament has to approve this budget for next year. This has been it for Defector Review for this week. Uh, the, the Defector Review is a weekly analysis of Mongolia's latest political, economic, and social issues by economist and columnist Mr. Jarasahin. Thank you very much for watching us. See you next week.